Hey, this is Digital Bike Computing. Today, we're going to talk about hacking. We're gonna be talking about the different techniques that a hacker will generally use to be able to get into an organization, to get into a system, to cause damage, to steal information. We're gonna be talking about the things that you can be doing to prevent hackers or to at least mitigate the risks associated with somebody trying to get into your network. So my name is Emilio. I work in the IT industry and I absolutely love it. And today we are talking about hacking. Hacking is a big subject. We can't cover it all in this one video, but we are going to talk about uh, what you can do, what are the things that you should be looking out for uh, in the realm of somebody trying to hack in. So we are gonna be talking about some stuff here that can be a little bit sensitive. So none of this is used to give you knowledge about going out and hacking yourself. This is the tricks and the tips that, you know, I guess a hacker would use, uh, the, the, the techniques that they would use to be able to get into systems. But we're gonna be talking about in the concept of trying to prevent these things from happening, more creating an awareness for you to know what the you know the standard operations of a hacker would be, or even the standard operations of what a pen tester would be. When you get a penetration tester in an organization that's trying to ethically hack into your network, what are the things that they generally will do uh, to try to get access to where they shouldn't? So the goal, of course, is of a hacker is to infiltrate a system, whether that is a network, a server, a website, an application, whatever it may be, the goal is to be able to get into a network to cause some havoc. They could be wanting to bring services down, they could be wanting to get in to be able to steal information, steal intellectual property, data that is owned by a particular company or a, or a particular business. There are various scenarios that a uh, if I use some examples of what a hacker may want to be able to do. They maybe want to be able to get into the network from, from the internet. There's a website that is hosted by a particular company and they want to infiltrate that website to be able to get into the network, bypass the firewall and get access. They could already be in the network uh, and want to get themselves elevated privileges. They, for example, are a standard uh, domain user on the network and they want to be able to get themselves domain administrator rights or an elevated level of privilege. But really, once they've got into the network, the end goal for most of the time is to either cause damage to the network or to steal information from a database, from a file server, from wherever it may be, to be able to use that just for a revenge purpose, to you know make a point around something, or to actually cause harm to that particular organization. So there are a number of things that a hacker will generally do. Let's use a scenario where the hacker doesn't know much about the organization or the organizational structure or the actual IT systems in place. So this is the goal of a, of a hacker that is outside of the organization, somebody that may be trying to get into the organization from the outside in, from the internet, or they may be able to try to sneak, them, you know, sneak themselves into an organization to, you know, to do their thing. So the thing that the, the, the hacker, a smart hacker, is going to want to do is to research the company. They're, go, they're going to want to know what the company does, how the company functions, uh, the size of the organization, how many offices they've got, um, what the staff count looks like, you know, perhaps what the organization chart looks like, to sort of map themselves a little bit of a diagram of what they're sort of dealing with. So generally they're gonna be doing things like, um, you know, going onto, onto uh, LinkedIn, uh, looking up the organization, trying to find out and map out the different um, you know, levels of the business, the different people in the business, trying to map out what their IT department looks like, um, you know, what sort of network engineers do they have, what sort of certifications does a systems engineer have. The other big thing they're gonna be trying to do is, uh, is using what's called social engineering. Essentially trying to trick themselves in to a, a person in an organization to give them information that they shouldn't. Um, to prevent this, uh, you need to get your staff aware of social engineering techniques and to not be stupid and give out information that they shouldn't. Uh, a organization should be training their staff internally to be aware of what's going on and to maintain their data, keep the, you know, keep the company secure. Something that a lot of, uh, I guess, hackers will try to do firstly is uh, send out phishing emails. Um, very, very you know, common technique that a lot of organizations face every single day, they're gonna get hundreds if not thousands of phishing emails that generally will get blocked by mail filtering systems. But essentially an email, like the name suggests, to fish and try to get some bait on the other side. So this is a user receiving an email that uh, is suspicious and the user 
following the instructions of that email, clicking on something that they shouldn't have, an attachment, a URL, or actually doing something that that email asks you to do when it's actually a fake email. So a lot of that comes down to just the staff awareness, giving the staff um, some knowledge about what they should and shouldn't be doing on the network. So if the hacker is uh, external to the business, uh, what they're gonna try to wanna do is they're gonna try to want to identify services that are exposed out to the internet for that particular organization. That organization could have, for example, a web server. That is their, their you know, the www.company.com.au. This is their primary company website. Uh, and, they, and they've seen that. They can see that the website is there and they're gonna to wanna to try to get in to that website. That website could lead into some internal services that are hosted within the organization itself. Also your email service. You know, you've got Outlook um, running on, on your computers and you've got Outlook web access, which is essentially Exchange being exposed out onto the internet so that people can log in to a Exchange portal or Office 365 or something like that. So a common thing that uh, a hacker is gonna wanna do is once they know a company's um, you know, web address, uh, they, 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 they know the, the domain name, which is the actual company name itself, it's owned by that company. They may wanna do what's called uh, port scanning across that particular uh, domain name or the IP address, the publicly listed IP address of that business or, or IP addresses of that, uh, of that company. They're gonna to wanna to be scanning uh, standard ports to try to see if there are particular ports open that they could try to um, attack or infiltrate. Now this may not necessarily be a website port, so websites generally are gonna be on port 80 or 443 or 8080. Um, so it's common that if your website is exposed on the internet, it's going to be using one of those ports. Um, so they're gonna be seeing that and gonna be trying to infiltrating it that way. But there's also a lot of other ports that um, IP addresses could be exposing out onto the internet, such as port 3389 for RDP, 5900 for VNC, um, you know, ports like 21, 22, 23, which are your um, FTP, SSH, Telnet, those sort of ports that um, people will generally try to attack to try to get into a, into a network that way. They could be trying brute force attacks with passwords to try to get access through these unknown, or well, through these um, uncommon ports outside of your standard ports 80 and 443. So the general recommendation is don't have ports open or exposed out to the internet through your firewall that don't need to be exposed. If the port 3389, which is for RDP, remote, you know, remote desktop traffic, doesn't need to be open, close it. From a website perspective, have that website in a DMZ zone, DMZ zone, uh, that website isolated from your internal network. Potentially even have that website hosted outside of your network, so it's not even connected to your internal network at all. So to mitigate risk against a, a website that is that needs to be exposed to the internet, obviously, um, make sure that that website is patched, that it is patched frequently, that it is not using a legacy old operating system, old software, an old version of Apache, of IIS, whatever that web service is. Uh, keep that stuff up to date. If you have uh, development or test um, or you know or um, other other you know test dev staging servers that are out exposed to the internet as well that are sort of correlated or related to your internal production website, also have those patched and tested. Very common for somebody that's trying to hack into a network, may not be able to get into the production one because it's pretty secure, but the staging and the dev ones which are also exposed to the internet are pretty poor. They can get into that and then they can snoop around on your network and go internally from there. To prevent things like phishing emails, make sure you've got good mail filtering software installed, uh, that it is actually checking uh, your, your mail regularly, that it's stopping things, that you've got a safe list, a white list, a black list of emails, blacklist emails that come through from you know, particular domain names, um, even have multiple levels of mail filters. It's not, it's not uncommon to find more than one mail filter in an organization. That way the mail has to traverse through multiple levels of security of filters before it actually gets in. Look at you know, protecting your internal emails by blocking certain attachment types, um, you know, executable files, batch files, you know, com files, those sort of files. Um, look at controlling URLs, you know, block URLs potentially from being clickable, executable within emails. Another technique that can be used if you are, you know, if they're trying to access uh, externally is uh, to do social engineering. Essentially, as I said before, trick somebody to get into the network or to give them access uh, to, act to areas that they shouldn't have access to. 
Uh, I'm sure you've all received phone calls from Microsoft, which is not really Microsoft, and they're asking you to give them access into your computer because they've detected that there's a vulnerability or a virus on your computer, and people go and do that. Um, so just making your staff aware of these social engineering techniques to not be able to do these sort of things. So that was somebody external trying to come in. What if they're already within your network? Now this could be, as, as I said, a hacker, it could be a pen tester that is already within the organization. They've already either infiltrated your system from the outside in, um, they've managed to get in through your website and access your internal uh, systems, or they've managed to walk in through the door um, and set themselves at a computer, or they've brought in their own computer from the outside and plugged it into your network, and they're already on your network. What are the different things that they're gonna to try to do once they are inside your network? So similar to the very initial uh, discovery phase that a hacker is going to try to look at, you know, trying to understand the organization, what they do, etc. Now it's a similar sort of exercise, but now focus on IT. They're gonna to wanna to have a bit of a discovery, a scan of the network. They want to build themselves a map of what the network looks like. What is the structure of the network? What sort of systems are running on the network? What sort of security is in place? So if they've gotten into your network, if they're physically within your, um, within your building, let's say a contractor, a customer, uh, the cleaners at night have walked in and they're trying to get access to something that they shouldn't have, um, can they access your wireless? If you have wireless uh, access points configured throughout your office and you've got you know, wireless security to be able to act, you know, let people access into the network, how secure is that wireless? Is it uh, just a static, password that never changes and that gives you full access into a corporate network do you have a guest network is your um wi-fi on ad you know ad authentication is required and obviously your ad passwords are reset frequently so control your wi-fi is your wi-fi um you know the actual name displayed on the list of wireless um you know available wireless networks look at controlling those sort of things to mitigate anybody from getting in is there a NAC, a network access control list essentially? Do they have control over plugging into a particular network point in the building? Uh, if a computer is brought from my house and I plug it into my corporate network, I will not be able to get a IP address. I will not be able to be authenticated on the network because there is a NAC in place to prevent that. Uh, very common technique that a hacker, once they're inside the building or a pen tester, uh, to try to infiltrate a, a, you know, a network is to go into things like the meeting rooms, a quiet space, uh, you know, a room that nobody is around, a space in the office that is pretty quiet, um, the reception computer when it's unmanned, something like that, and plug in a device into a network point that is right there. Uh, these network points should not allow access into the network. Um, printer, for example, a printer that is plugged into a network point. If I unplug that printer, plug in my computer that I've got, you know, brought from home, I should not be able to get access to the internet. So have those controls to prevent a hacker from getting in from that way. If those network points are open, um, a hacker can easily bring in a computer with something like Kali Linux installed. Essentially, it's a free Linux, uh, you know, operating system that is used for pen testing. Um, it has hundreds of tools to be able to go and test the security of a network. You don't want a computer with Kali installed, somebody that knows how to use it, uh, plugging into your network and snooping around and trying to get access to things through there. The other thing a, a sophisticated hacker may do is they're going to want to have a look at the physical surroundings of the building. Uh, they're gonna walk around. Do they see, uh, and if they're in the, around the IT area, do they see network maps? Uh, are the cabinets locked that contain confidential information? Um, are access passes, you know, building access passes, fobs, those sort of things, are they controlled, are they lockable, that nobody has access to them? Is the server room secure? Is there a space where they have just a small little comms cabinet with some equipment or a bigger space? Can I access that uh, without being authenticated? Can I just open up the door? Uh, can I go up through the roof, you know, and, and you know, walk over uh, on the roof into the server room? You know, is there, is there controls in place to prevent things like that from happening? We mentioned uh, meeting rooms, you know, a lot of places will have very secure, um, you know, that they're, they're gonna control the network, um, the network points themselves to not allow people to be able to access their own, you know, bring their own computer in, but they could have a presentation computer set up, you know, a computer set up in a, in a meeting room 
for presentations or a boardroom for presentations? Um, is that computer accessible um, by somebody that they shouldn't have access to? What if I myself bring some USB sticks? A very common, common thing that you'll see is, um, if you ever watch the show, Mr. Robot, great show, recommend you should watch it. Um, it's just a common technique of leaving USB sticks uh, floating around. A whole bunch of USB sticks with uh, vulnerable software, uh, with software that could infiltrate a computer network that could give particular access to a hacker that you know shouldn't have access to something on the network. And they just leave these USB sticks either outside the building, near the lifts, uh, around the office space. And what's somebody gonna do? They're gonna see a USB stick. Oh, I wonder what's on this USB stick. And they plug it in and there you go. And then we talk about the social engineering element, but now within the organization. If you are in a larger organization, it's not uncommon for not all the staff members to know everybody in the IT space. If you're in a company of thousands and thousands of staff and the IT department is made up of hundreds of staff, you're not gonna know everybody there. So a common technique is somebody who is say doing a pen test or who is a hacker who's actually in there to cause some harm, will go up to a random person in the office and say, hey, I'm from IT, can I please just get access to your computer to upgrade something? I need to upgrade the latest version of uh, you know, your, your Google Chrome browser and most people are gonna say, oh yeah, sure. They're just gonna be automatically trusting that that person is who they say they are, give them access, and then that person could then install some malicious code on that computer to be able to scan equipment, to scan software, do you know key logging and check passwords and those sort of things quite easily. Or you could even just call them up, call them up on the phone, say, hey, I'm from IT, um, I just need to upgrade something on our backend system, I just need to get your username and password and you'll be surprised how many people just give out their passwords. So once I've got access into the network, I start to build my network map. I want to know what my network looks like. I can use commands such as net use and net group um, through a command prompt to get a bit more of an understanding of what my domain looks like. So most organizations will use Active Directory in the back end. They're gonna have a number of users split up there, number of different OUs. They're gonna have domain admins, enterprise admins, multiple domain controllers. So using these commands in the command prompt, I can actually get a bit more of an understanding of what I'm dealing with. I can spit out all this information to sort of know who I should be targeting and what the sort of the AD structure looks like. Using commands like GP results, so get uh, an understanding of what the group policies are applied across my particular computer. So if I've got a computer on the network that I now have access to, running a GP result dash R, I can see exactly what group policies are applied to a computer. And getting a good understanding on that computer or a server, whatever maybe they've got access to, what sort of services are running? What sort of monitoring is uh, installed on that computer? What sort of endpoint protection, you know, for, for checking malware, viruses, etc.? cetera? Uh, is there any software that is checking my key logs, my keystrokes, logging software, uh, things that are checking my event viewer, those sort of things. So you wanna make sure that you know what software is running because if a hacker or pen tester, pen, pen tester tries to get in, um, they don't wanna be just cut off straight away if they've got some certain particular you know, software running on a computer. So making sure that you do have adequate software, endpoint protection software, a good firewall configured uh, prevents these sort of things from spreading. Now something that you wanna to try to prevent is uh, computers running non-authorized software. Um, so you can actually put systems in place where only approved applications are allowed to be able to scan or to, to, to be installed or executed from a computer. This prevents somebody plugging in a USB stick or you know installing something that they shouldn't have onto a computer. It actually is a good security measure to be having in general in most organizations. What you wanna prevent is somebody from being able to install some IP scanning software, some port scanning software on a network to be able to scan the network. To be able to install something like Wireshark. Wireshark can be installed quite easily to be able to scan some traffic on the network. Have a look at some subnets, have a look at some MAC addresses. Try to familiarize themselves with MAC address uh, you know, vendors. What are the vendors we are sort of dealing with? What sort of VLANs are in place? We talked about um, you know, USB sticks being used. Uh, look at perhaps preventing USB sticks from even being executed on computers. So blocking USB stick um, access on computers uh, 
which is a common tactic that a hacker will use to be able to try to install software onto a computer that way. You can also look at limiting um, administrator access, local admin access for users. If a user is not a local administrator on their computer, then they are controlled or limited about what they, actually, what they can actually do. They may not be able to install software unless they have an administrator come in and install it for them. So once the hacker or the pen tester has actually scanned the network and they sort of understand what they're dealing with, they know the IPs that are in use, the general IP subnet ranges, uh, the, the directory structure of Active Directory, those sort of things, um, they're now gonna try to gain access. Uh, this is them perhaps trying to brute force them, themselves into the, into the network, into a particular system, into a particular server. Uh, generally, you can brute force against a list of known passwords commonly used passwords. You can easily get those off the internet to know exactly what are the most common hundred thousand most used passwords. So within an organization, ensure complicated passwords, obviously. Um, th th this password list shouldn't even be allowed within an organization, right? The, the password of passwords should never be allowed. So setting up complex passwords against every single user making sure that they are certain characteristics, you know, that they've got certain uppercase, lowercase, hash, at signs, dollar signs, whatever. There are certain character length that they regularly expire so that they have to reset them. Uh, ensures that the simple brute force attacks of known passwords is a lot more difficult. Put systems in place around tracking invalid login attempts. If the account is attempted so many times, lock the account out. If there are so many incorrect logon attempts, notify a particular person in the IT department. Remember that um, the goal of a hacker is to be able to, once they've scanned the network, if, they, if they're not having that much success going in an old fashioned way via a username and password, they're gonna to try to infiltrate perhaps via known vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities that have already been identified and patched by vendors, say by Microsoft or Apple, um, and they're gonna to try to go in that way. So make sure that all the systems are patched, that they're patched often so that known vulnerabilities are fixed. Not just Microsoft and Apple and, and the, the operating systems themselves, but applications such as Google Chrome, Flash, um, .NET frameworks, these sort of things also have vulnerabilities. So patch this stuff frequently to prevent unauthorized access. The next thing they're gonna to wanna to do is if they've got some form of access, they're gonna to try to access file paths. Um, they may know what the file server is now. They may know the IP address, the host name. So they're gonna to try to access file paths within that file server. They may be trying to access the C dollar, the F dollar, the H dollar of file servers, of individual computers, the admin shares of individual computers, individual servers. They may also wanna to try to get themselves an IT administrator password. Because obviously if they've got themselves an IT administrator username and password, they can do a lot more than a standard end user password. So what you could potentially do, or what a hacker will potentially do, is perhaps they, they're gonna go up to a, a random person in the organization and say, hey look, I'm from IT, I need to install some software. And then they install some software that is going to make the CPU go crazy, or the computer run very slow, or they could install something funky on a, on a server that causes the server you CPU to spike at 100%, causing a alert to be sent out or a phone call to be called to IT. IT being the good people that they are, are gonna to try to wanna to resolve the problem. They're gonna log in and investigate. You've now installed some malware on there, checking some key logging, you know, checking the passwords, and then they've already now got the administrator password. You've essentially set a trap for them. They've gone in, you've now got the credentials that they shouldn't. The end goal really is to be able to steal data, right? That, that's really what we wanna be able to do. So another measure that you could do is look at encrypting the pass, the, encrypting the hard drives of end user computers. So this is if a computer is taken, you know, there's some sensitive data on a finance person's computer, that computer cannot be opened up and you, you know, take out the, um, the hard drive and read the data on. So that's gaining access. From there, they, the hackers generally wants to stay invisible. They wanna to try to stay undetected for as long as possible. They don't wanna be able to be detected um, as doing anything suspicious. So they're gonna to wanna to try to stay invisible and covering their tracks as much as possible. They're going to want, be want to um, uh, performing these checks, these vulnerability scans, trying to get into the networks when there's generally people not around. Uh, it could be in a, in a space in an office where there's uh, not many people around during a big meeting, a corporate meeting, the office is empty, uh, late at night, um, on a weekend, generally where there's not gonna be many staff around, so not much suspicion is going to, you know, no one's gonna suspect anything because no one's there, right? 
Um, a very common technique as well is, is for a hacker to infiltrate or try to infiltrate a system during a IT freeze. Say for example, between the Christmas and New Year break, where there's going to be skeleton staff. There's not many IT people available because they're all away. Um, that's a good time. So prevent things is, you know, have good security, have CCTV, make sure that you've got the right people there at the right time so that you, you know, you've, you've always got a strong enough presence to be able to control and at least identify things before they actually go out of, out of hand. Obviously, as the hackers go in through, they're gonna to wanna to be covering their tracks, removing suspicious software that's been installed. They're gonna be removing, you know, a code that's been installed, those sort of things. You know, for example, um, PowerShell is not an approved application on an end user computer. Why should somebody be running PowerShell on an end user computer? So things like that should trigger an alert that IT is aware and go and investigate. And then the last thing is exploit. Once they've got in, once they've got into what they want to do, the end goal is really to be able to cause damage, exploit the vulnerability, get in, take data and cause some damage. So there you go, that is my summary. Um, a lot of stuff there to cover. We've, we've touched very high level about a lot of those. I do have a number of other videos around cybersecurity and recommendations around hardening cybersecurity um, you know, on servers, on networks, in other videos on my channel, you can check those out. But either way, that is my video for today. I hope you found it helpful. I would love it if you gave me a thumbs up on this video, like this video, and also subscribe to Digital Bike Computing for a whole bunch of more videos.